Okay, so now we're going to talk about the processes and the ITTOs for Chapter 5, Project Scope Management. So remember, ITTOs are inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs for a process. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So just as a reminder, there are six processes in this knowledge area. Four are in planning, two in monitoring and controlling. So uh, the first, plan scope management, is where we're documenting how we're going to define and control our scope. Planning it out. And then we're going to collect requirements, documenting the needs of the stakeholders. And then we're going to define our scope. We're going to take those requirements and scope a project, develop a detailed description of the project and the product. And then we're going to create a WBS. We're going to take that scope, that detailed description, and decompose the project work into smaller components. And a WBS is a work breakdown structure. And then as we monitor the project, we're going to validate the scope formalize the acceptance of those deliverables, and then we're going to control the scope. We monitor scope and manage changes in the scope baseline over time. So let's take a look at the first process, plan scope management. So as a reminder, we're documenting how scope will be defined and controlled, and also how we're going to collect requirements. Okay, so here's the ITTOs. Let's focus first on the outputs, the scope management plan and the requirements management plan. So the requirements management plan is going to document how requirements will be managed, how we're going to collect those from customers. And the scope management plan is going to talk about how scope will be managed. How are we going to take our requirements and define and scope our project? What are the techniques we're going to use, our methods, and so on? And as a reminder, both of these are components of the project management plan. Just a few other things, too, to note here. <clears throat> In a Almost all of these processes that start with plan something, plan scope management, plan schedule management, the project management plan is the input. And the individual plans, like a scope management plan or a requirements management plan, are an output. So we've got the project charter and the project management plan coming in, and also enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. Those are two very common inputs. You see them on most processes. And then you're going to use expert judgment and alternative analysis as we're thinking about the scope and how we're going to define it. You might be thinking about how we're going to come up with different alternatives for, um, uh, for work. What are different ways of getting the work of the project done? We'll have some meetings to, to do this as well. Okay, after we have planned scope management, we're going to start collecting requirements, documenting the needs of our stakeholders. So, don't get too overwhelmed here. We're going to break some of this down, but these are the ITTOs for this process. And what you have coming in is the project management plan, and it's going to include things like what we just created, the scope management plan and the requirements management plan, because those are going to tell you how to collect your requirements. And then you could also have things like project documents, like a stakeholder register, and a stakeholder register is going to tell you who your stakeholders are, because uh, the reason why that is an input, because those stakeholders are going to be a source of requirements. And then you could have agreements, um, you know, in original agreements on, that kind of get projects started. There could be some, uh, some perspective on what customers are expecting from the project. And again, you've got inputs of enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. It's real common. And then as your outputs, you have requirements documentation and the requirements traceability matrix. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. But you've also got all these tools to help you collect requirements for your customers. And so we're going to break these down just a bit. There's a variety of them. And some of them include interviewing. Obviously, as you interview your customers, they can give you feedback on what they would like the product to or project to accomplish. You could use observation, the nominal group technique. It's a method for brainstorming with groups. Document analysis, context diagrams, surveys focus groups where you bring in subject matter experts to give you um, input on the project, benchmarking, comparing ourselves to other organizations, facilitation, so having kind of organized, facilitated discussions with our stakeholders about what they're looking for, and then prototypes. Prototypes can help us gather requirements. When we have a working version of a product and we share it with our customer, they can give us feedback about what they want and they don't want. So here's just a, a description of each of those. Maybe I'll pick out a couple, but 
what I would suggest maybe at this time is you might want to stop this video and make sure you're familiar with um, all these, or at least focus in on those things that you're that uh, you, you don't know. Uh, just a couple of things. Focus groups, the third from the top, those bring together stakeholders and subject matter experts to learn about their needs, having focus groups. Then you could have voting. You could be voting on requirements by the stakeholders. You could also have mind mapping techniques or affinity diagrams. These are ways of kind of classifying requirements, consolidating them, organizing them. And then you've got the nominal group technique. It's a mix of brainstorming and voting. Uh, and the best ideas go forward. It's a group brainstorming technique. Then you could use facilitation, focused workshops with key stakeholders, as well as context diagrams. These are used a lot in technology, so it's an illustration of a scope showing how a system works and people interact with it. So you might show how a uh, um, an application, a, a smartphone application, is used by someone and what different pages they would go through and where data gets sent and it gives you context and helps you understand what you might need on the project. And then prototypes used to gather early feedback and product, requir product requirements by sharing a working version. When you can share a working version of a product project with someone, it, uh, it gives them, you know, it's really nice because you get good feedback on it. If they can see it in their hands, if they can experiment with it, you get good, uh, um, good thoughts back. Okay. And again, the real, the outputs of collect requirements are the requirements documentation and requirements traceability matrix. So just a few things about requirements documentation. It's describing how the requirements meet the business need. And they should be, or they could, get more detailed over time. That's typically what happens. That's this idea of progressive elaboration that we've talked about. And they must be clear, traceable, and acceptable to key stakeholders. It should also be in a written format. you got to write down your requirements. And the requirements traceability matrix, sometimes that goes alongside just your other requirements documents. It's going to link requirements to deliverables and to business value. So if there's a requirement on the project, it should link back or tie to a deliverable that we're going to be creating and to a business need. All those things to trace together. We shouldn't just have these random requirements that don't help us meet objectives that aren't tied to some business need. And, that, um, and also the same for deliverables. They should tie back to requirements and to business value and, um, and need. Okay, so now that we've planned scope management and we've collected requirements, now we're going to define our scope. Develop a detailed project and product description. A lot of times these are just narratives a few paragraphs long. And here's what the ITTOs look like. And as you recall, in a lot of these planning processes or in plot processes in general, outputs from one become inputs to another, and that's no different here. So in defined scope, one of the inputs from the project management plan is the scope management plan, because that's going to tell you how to define your scope. Your plan is going to tell you how to do that. You can have some other project documents like your requirements documentation. That's going to be important as you uh, define your scope. And then enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. All going to be key inputs. And then tools. Uh, you could use things like alternatives analysis. You'd figure out what different options there are for getting the work done. Maybe there's a cheaper, faster alternative. And then you could use facilitation to define scope. And then we'll talk about product analysis in a minute. But um, actually, let's just talk about alternatives analysis for a second. I know we've already covered it, but it's coming up with as many ideas as possible for getting the work done. Alternatives analysis. Now let's talk about another technique for defining scope, product analysis. So this is defining scope by asking questions about the use, characteristics, and other relevant aspects of what's going to be manufactured. You're defining scope by asking questions about how people are going to use something. Here's an example. If you're creating a fitness tracker, you might be asking potential customers, how long will it be used each day? For what types of exercises? Under what weather conditions? These are all things that you might want to be asking your customer as you start to determine or define your scope. Now the key output here is going to be the project scope statement. That's the detailed project description. And you could be making updates to documentation. Updates to your requirements documentation or your stakeholder register. Or an assumption log perhaps. As you define your scope, maybe there's some assumptions you're making. Okay, now let's talk about creating the WBS. So at this point we've collected requirements. And we've developed a detailed description of our scope as we defined it. 
And now we're going to create the WBS. What we're doing here is we're taking our detailed product or project description and decomposing it into smaller components, which makes it easier to manage. Okay, here are the ITTOs for this process. So you've got your scope management plan coming in, which is part of the project management plan. And then you've got your scope statement as well. You've got to take your scope statement and that's what you're going to decompose. And you've also got your requirements documentation that might be helpful here too. And then you've got enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. Again, you're going to see those a lot as inputs. And the tools you have are expert judgment and decomposition. So let's talk about decomposition for just a second. So this is dividing the project scope and project deliverables into smaller, more manageable components. We're decomposing and breaking the work down. And the example that we've showed in the other video is that you can decompose work by deliverables. Like if we're building a house, deliverables could be the foundation, the walls, plumbing, roofing, electrical, landscaping, and so on. Or you could break it down by phase. Planning, design, construction, inspection, finishing, and so on. You could, it doesn't matter, you, you know, you, you would know best about how to categorize that work. Okay, now let's talk about the output, the key output, the scope baseline. And if you recall, there's three key components of that. The project scope statement, the work breakdown structure, and the WBS dictionary. Those are the three key components. So your project scope statement is a description of the project scope, and you've actually already created that. That was your key output of defining the scope. And then you've got your WBS. That's taking the scope that you've defined, the scope statement, and breaking it down or decomposing it into more manageable pieces of work. And then you've got your WBS dictionary, which accompanies your WBS, which is detailed information about WBS components. And if you recall, the lowest level of the WBS is the work package. And um, we, you know, an example of that is for building the house, it could be the, the roof, it could be the foundation, it could be the walls. Those are, you could get lower if you wanted to, but the lowest level is the work package. And oftentimes we think of those as nouns. And the WBS dictionary is going to have things like a code of account, like a number that we can use to tie costs or expenses to that. So we can kind of categorize costs and know how much we're spending in each area for better tracking. It can also include the description of work, schedule milestones, resources required, acceptance criteria and so on. Acceptance criteria is basically us um, getting feedback from our stakeholders about what, or sponsors, about what's acceptable. What um, do we have to do to complete this and consider it as accepted by the customer? Their criteria for accepting it. Okay, now that we've at this point created our scope baseline, we're going to get the work done and then monitor it over time. So the two processes we have in monitoring are validate scope and control scope. So in validate scope, we're formalizing acceptance of completed deliverables. We got to get approval from our customer. So here are the ITTOs. You have the project management plan coming in, and you also have verified deliverables coming in. And uh, so basically you've got your plan and your project management plan, your scope management plan, scope baseline, and your requirements management plan. And you're going to compare that plan to your actuals, your deliverables, what was actually produced. And these are verified deliverables because before you get or try to get acceptance from your customer, you want to check them for quality. And so you verify that they're correct. Now you can seek acceptance from the customer. And also work performance data is a source of actual actuals. And so you're taking, again, your plan and comparing it to your actuals, deliverables, and work performance data. And as your customer, your sponsor inspects these, they could use obviously inspection to make sure that they're acceptable and then voting potentially. And then here are some of your outputs. You've got accepted deliverables, work performance information, change requests, and project document updates. So let me just highlight a couple things here. We're taking our verified deliverables, a key input, and we've checked them for quality. And hopefully at the end of it, we get accepted deliverables. So if you recall, we looked at this diagram in a previous video, a couple of previous videos. We're in the validate scope process, the third on the right, and verified deliverables are coming in. Those are deliverables that we've checked for correctness and for quality. And then we're hopefully getting acceptance and they become accepted deliverables. That's the output from this process. Just a couple of other things too.
as I mentioned in a previous video, in these monitoring controlling processes, change requests are often an output because we're checking the project and maybe making corrections as needed. And the way to think about this is I, t I said that monitoring controlling processes are kind of like going to the doctor. Your doctor, when he you know, checks to make sure you're healthy, he may say, you know what, you need to change your diet. You need to get exercise more. You need to make a change in your life. And so it's the same way in a project. We monitor it and make changes or propose changes as needed. And then also project document updates. Again, that's going to be common in these monitoring controlling processes. Okay, now let's move ahead to control scope, the last process in this chapter. We're monitoring project scope and managing changes to the scope baseline. So here's our ITTOs. And again, what's common here for these types of processes when we monitor the project is that we've got our plan, and you see several aspects in our plan here. We're going to compare that to what actually happened. In this case, it's work performance data. And so it might include things like what work we accomplished when we accomplished it. We're going to compare that to our plan. And it could also include some other documents like a lesson learned register, requirements documentation, and requirements traceability matrix, and also organizational process assets. Now, as we compare the plan to the actual, the plan to the work performance data, the tools we're going to use to do that is look at vari use variance and trend analysis. We're trying to figure out, did we accomplish what we were supposed to? Is there any variance? between those two things? And are we on track, are we on a trend to get all of the planned work accomplished? And is it, we, are we expecting it'll meet the quality requirements or the acceptance criteria of the customer? And their outputs are gonna be work, uh, work performance information, so we're taking data and turning into information. That's common in these controlling processes like control scope or control schedule. You're gonna take the data and turn it into information and then you could have change requests again. It, those are common on monitoring processes. We monitor the project and propose changes if they're needed. And then making updates and documentation. Let me talk for a minute, though, about variance analysis. Basically, what we're doing is we're analyzing the difference between the baseline, our approved plan, and what actually happened. It's going to be important, variance analysis.